ago now, was in the Kingdom Players all four years that I knew him and traveled and got to see them way back then. And I know that they have a rich history. They're under the direction of um, Michael Del Bonis, who actually is not with them tonight. He's a teacher, teaches at least, so he's teaching a summer class right now. But they have a student leader, Jordan, who is uh, going to be leading them tonight. Fantastic group of young people. We're going to say a word of prayer, and then I'm just going to invite them to come and and uh, share with us and minister to us, and, and, and it's going to be a wonderful evening. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise and glory for what we're about to experience tonight, because I know that each and every one of these young people have come with just the desire in their heart to minister unto you in spirit and in truth, to worship you and to offer their talents, their time. Know that they are hardworking, and I just pray that you would anoint them in the mighty name of Jesus. Unite our hearts together tonight. Help us, Lord, to be seated in heavenly places and experience you in a fresh and a new way. We give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would y'all help me welcome the kingdom players from New York? Good evening. How are y'all up tonight? Okay, still recovering over the nap. All right, so are we. It's all right. Praise God. Um, we are King of Players, and like you said, my name is Jordan. We're from southeastern Tennessee, uh, from Lee University. And we are actually the premier traveling drama group from Lee University. So sorry if you thought we were going to sing. You don't want that. I promise you, we'll, we'll stick to the dramas for you. Um, we actually have a table out back. Uh, we are the recruitment team for Lee, uh, as far as drama goes, and we'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. We have a great online program, uh, especially if you're interested in campus life. We'd love to talk to you about that. Um, but more than that, what we love to do is to minister. That's, uh, that's our primary goal, uh, is to minister and worship with you. So I want to say a big thank you, and especially from all of us. Thank you for having us tonight. It means a lot. Um, so we're going to do some funny stuff for you at the beginning. If you want to laugh, feel free to laugh. We'll do better if you laugh. Uh, just break the ice there. If you, later on in the service, feel like you need to cry, go ahead and grab a Kleenex. Uh, we're just here to, to worship with you, and however the Lord leads you, we'd like to see that. So I'm going to hand it off to Sydney. This is our first. Hi, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our first skit that we're going to do. Um, so a lot of times in life, personally and as maybe a church we get into this stump where we start pursuing God and our relationship with him in a different way um, maybe it, you start thinking of it as a ladder maybe you grew up being taught this way that um, our relationship with God is like a ladder where we build the steps so um, by following the rules like okay I read my Bible every day I go to church I pray every day I go to camp meetings this kind of thing and as we build the steps we're like oh we're getting closer to God one step further closer higher um, but I think the problem in that thinking is that as we do that, we start to define our relationship with God as more of just a process with rules and regulations. And just like it is important for us to follow those rules and to do those things to enhance our relationship with God, that's not the cornerstone of what our relationship is. It's not just the rules. It's also the relationship and pursuing Him with our heart and using those rules and those different things that we can do just to get closer to God. Um, but a lot of times as a church and as an individual, we start not thinking that way. And this is just a funny way of showing that. Um, it's called How to Be a Christian. How to Be a Christian, featuring John Louvier. He accepted Christ. For John, it was the best day of his life. Better than graduating college. Better than his wedding day. And yes, even better than when Alabama won its 17th national championship. Everyone has been congratulating and showing him so much love. So go on, everyone, show him some love and give him a hand. Said stop. <laughs> Thank you. Now that the celebrating is done, we'll have to get down to the business of being a Christian. Are you ready? First things first, picking out your Bible. 
the Bible will guide you through all the tricky situations that living life as a Christian will present. So you'll need to find one you can understand. Fortunately, there are a variety for you to choose from. There's the KJV, that is the King James Version, the NIV, the New International Version, the ASV, CEV, GNV, ISV, NLT, ESV, BLT, TNT, LMN, P, equals MC squared. Whether you choose the King James versions, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or the Messages version, you can fly, I love Jesus. Matters not, so long as you read it every day. The next thing you'll need to know is how to pray. Posture is important here, so it's best to start on your knees. Very good. Now bow your head. Close your eyes. No peeking. That's it. You're natural. Now clasp your hands together. Well, that's... <laughs> that's very good, John. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. As long as you're sincere, just go ahead and clasp your hands again. And maybe drop your elbows just a bit. That's it. <laughs> Now, there are a few key words you should always include in your prayer. Father, uh, no, not daddy -o. Mercy, thou, heads of protection, rebuke, enemy, blessings, Jesus, leaders, overseas, healing, and amen. You can't go wrong. Now, choosing a church will also be very important. There are the Methodists, the Episcopals, the Lutherans, and, okay, who let the Baptist in here? Oh, no, no, I Joking. And let's not forget the Church of God. The best part is, John, you can choose whichever church you want. <clears throat> uh, uh, uh. Wonderful. <laughs> now that you've chosen a church, remember, John, you're going to need to pay your tithes. Oh, come on, John, it's for the church. <laughs> well, let's not be greedy. Wonderful! <laughs> You've done a fine job, John, and you're well on your way. But if you haven't figured out already, I don't have all the answers. Just do your best to try and live as Christ lived, and you can't miss that way. Well, that's all for today, folks. Join us next week at the same time for How to Run an Effective Nursery featuring John Bowie. No, 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 no babies. Okay, not good. Okay, how are you? Hi, guys. My name is Gabby. This next kid that we're going to be doing for you is talking about how sometimes we as Christians can know the Bible, but it's just the text that we're really knowing. We're not really trying to take the time to learn what the text is saying to us. Kind of an example is that when I was growing up throughout elementary and middle school, um, we would always have Bible verse quizzes, and I would spend all of my time trying to learn the Bible verse just so I can get that 100 on the test, but then once it was over, it meant nothing to me, and as long as I got the 100, that's what counted. And that's not how we're supposed to see scripture. We're supposed to really meditate and take the time to know what it's saying to us. And so this is just a funny skit looking at a situation like that, and it's called Two Shirts. Hey everybody, welcome to church. Good to see you, Kim. How are the kids? Little monsters? Well, that's why they're in kids' church. Am I right? Praise God. Find yourself a seat. Come on in. John, nice to see you, buddy. Man, that tan's looking good, brother. You've been on that golf course working that swing. Praise God. Find yourself a seat. Come on, man. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. Welcome to the News Nazarene Church of the Glory to God Community Center of the Lord God Almighty, my God. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's, uh... Good to see you. I don't think I've ever seen you here before. Well, actually, it's my first time, oh. so... <laughs> first time. Uh, yes, sir. So, the world's just been beating you down. Well, actually, you're telling you're worthless, and you know what? Maybe you're just here looking for some free coffee and donuts. Oh, wow. Maybe you're here just chasing some skirt. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, brother, my God's got you here for a reason. You're right. My job is to relocate me to the area, so I'm looking for a church to get plugged into. That's all. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, there, buddy. You 
have a job. Yes, sir. I have a job. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, you got any collared shirts? You know, to wear to church. Yeah, I have one, but it's at the cleaners. I really don't have a lot of clothes. Oh, so. You only have one collared shirt. Yes, sir. Do you one. mind if I ask why? A little bit. Hey, uh, brother, I'm not just the greeter here. I'm also the head of security. So if I want to know why you've only got one collared shirt, you're going to tell me. Okay, look. I just felt like the Lord was convicting me a few years ago to give a lot of my, away a lot of my clothes. It, it's like that one scripture says, Any man who has two shirts should give one to the man who has none, and the same with food. I knew, it. Service, sir. Okay. I knew it. Hey, we've got a code of false prophet. False prophet? False prophet. What are you talking about? about? No! Oh, brother, Evan, I've never seen a live one. Well, you have now, oh. sister. He came in here talking this hippy-dippy nonsense oh. about taking his shirt off and using it as a lasso to take somebody out around the ankles. It was crazy. Oh. You know what? I'm going to call the prayer warrior. If we're going to get Marlene in here, we're going to pray it out. We're going to pray it out tonight. It needs to be something like that. He even talked about his shirt jumping off his body and then starting to try to wear other people. It was the craziest thing I've ever heard, sister. That ain't modest. That ain't modest. You know who's going to flip? Who? Pastor. Woo! <laughs> That's my word. That's the best service I think I've ever preached. One day I want to go. But what is going on here? Oh, brother, Evan, let me tell him. All right, you can tell him. Okay, so I can't do it. All right, I'll tell you. Pastor, we caught one. You caught one what? A false prophet. You don't say. Oh, I do say. <laughs> what was it then? Can't meet him back in 06 was the last time we saw one of those weirdos. Yeah. He was a fast little joker. So he right on out the doors. Oh, he did, he did. Well, what tipped you off? Well, he said he's going to take his shirt off and uh, throw it. That's what he said. Yeah, he said something about taking his shirt off and then uh, people were going to be worn by shirts. It was crazy. That is crazy. That's insane. Well, what's his name? Huh. Um, see, Pastor, with all the nonsense this jerk was spouting, I didn't think to uh, catch his name. It's okay, you gotta guard your heart, brother. Yeah. Keep it guarded. <clears throat> What's your name, son? Kevin. Kevin, what? Kevin Blaylock. Kevin Blaylock. <laughs> Are you telling me you kidnapped a Blaylock? Well, Pastor, I didn't know he was a Blaylock when I kidnapped him, clearly. <laughs> Look, we've got a revival with Pastor Blaylock next week, and if he figures out we kidnapped his nephew, he's going to cancel us, and we cannot afford that as a church. I know, Pastor. What are we going to do? <laughs> what was it he said exactly? He said he's going to take his shirt off and throw it in a fire. Yeah, and then he talked about shirts wearing other people. It was crazy, Pastor. It does sound insane, but if he is who he says he is, we have to be sure. Just <clears throat> follow my lead. <laughs> You're scooting off too quickly. We've got some work to do here. Look, my God's a God of second chances, so I'm going to give you a second chance right now. Are you a false prophet? No, I'm just looking for a church to get plugged into. That's all. Yeah, I'm a false prophet. It sounds like it. Sounds like it. You better watch your tone there, cowboy. Ooh, this is my church. Ooh. This is God's house. He needs some respect, son. Now, what was it you said exactly? Look, all I said was that any man who has two shirts should give one to the man who has none. And the same with food. That's it. I see. Look, I'm glad you do because you love body work from head. Did you catch Brother Evan? That is absurd. I mean, could you imagine only having one collar shirt, Pastor? <laughs> that would be something. That thing would get nasty. You know, I often wonder, Pastor, what would Jesus wear in these days times? One of the trying mysteries of our not now, Phyllis, we're debating. One of the trying mysteries of our faith. I think he's more like a bow tie guy. Pastor. Maybe a necktie. Yeah. Um, Luke 311. Luke 311. She's bringing up the word. Smart girl, Luke 311. I bet you're sweating right now, false prophet. It's up where you're going. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, man, I'm going to read the verse. Luke 3, 11. If any man has two shirts, he should give... Uh, one second. He should give one to the man who has none, and the same with food. The same with food. Did you double-check the NIV? And the message. And the message. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> hey there, partner. Let me get you untied there. Let's get that out of your mouth. That don't belong there. I don't know how that got in there. Wow. <laughs> Brother Blaylock, we are so pleased to have you in the First God Glory National Center of the God of International and National Love. And I want to tell you that that right there is just a nice shirt.
Okay, so at this time I want to take a moment and just kind of introduce the team uh, to you before we go on. And actually the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to let them introduce themselves when I'll start. Um, Jordan McCann, I'm from Tyler, Texas. I am a digital media studies major with an emphasis on cinema. Um, and I am a fifth year senior. So. Uh, I am Evan Corson. I am from South Georgia. And I am a senior pastoral ministries major. I'm Rebecca Proctor, and I'm from Aiken, South Carolina. I'm a public relations major, and I'm a senior. I'm Sydney Brown, and I'm from Cleveland, Tennessee. I'm a junior studying graphic design. I am John Bouvier. I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm a junior studying digital media. I'm Gabby McDonald. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm a junior theater major. I am Kevin Morrison. I am a senior youth ministry major from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, my name is Carissa Lindhart. I'm from Fort Mill, South Carolina. Um, I am a sophomore education major. Thank you so much. All right. Friends, I hope you are enjoying the ministry of the Kingdom Players tonight, are you? You've been blessed tonight. Have a great time. And tonight our ushers are going to give us an opportunity to give. Um, I know you are no stranger to the kind of ministry that the team here does tonight. Um, all of us have been blessed out through the years by the campus ministries of Lee University. And you know that they're a long way from Lee University tonight, right? Yeah. And so we want to be a blessing to them tonight. They've come to share their gift with us, and we want to share a gift with them as well. And so tonight we want to sow good seed into good soil tonight. When uh, the team leaves here tomorrow, they'll be heading up to Camp Utopia, which is where about 22 of our folks are right now, uh, headed up that direction, uh, to bless them in this upcoming week. And so they're going to do a great job there and uh, be part of what God's going to do in the life of our teenagers as well as others from all over the state of Alabama. Amen. And so we want to pray tonight that God will just bless their efforts there, their ministry there. Um, we don't know who they'll connect with this week that God's calling the ministry, that God is calling to Lee University. Um, and this week could be a great opportunity, a life-changing moment for some of our students even to stumble into their calling, their gifting, and find the place that would equip them for their future in ministry. Amen? Amen. So let's pray and let's do that. And let's bless them tonight. I know you've come to give and to uh, sow into the ministry tonight. So would you pray with me tonight? Father, we love you. We thank you tonight for the chance, Lord, to have our friends with us. Lord, uh, or sons and daughters from our own, uh, our own uh, university. And we praise you for uh, the work that you've called them to do tonight. Lord, we thank you for it. Uh, we pray, God, that you would bless them tonight in all that they do. Lord, we pray that you keep your hand of protection on them, keep them safe as they travel. Lord, and all throughout this week as they go and they minister, Lord, uh, tomorrow night at Camp Utopia, we pray your, uh, your favor would rest on them. We pray, Lord, that you would give them uh, the ability just to connect in a way with the students there uh, like never before. That, Lord, you would help them as they, C.S. Lewis once said, truck the gospel past the watchful dragons. And, Lord, the message of Jesus would just sneak in around the defenses of people who may have their walls up. They're, they're going to interact with some kids this week, Lord, who may have their defenses up against the music or certainly against the preaching or against the devotions. And Lord, sometimes drama has a way of just kind of getting around those defenses. And before they know it, their heart's been impacted with the truth. And Father, we pray for that this week. We pray that you would use the ministry of drama. Lord Jesus, just as you use parables and many other things in the Word to get the truth to find its mark in a person's heart. Uh, before their head could object. We pray, God, that for them. We pray that that kind of anointing would rest on them this week. We pray that, Lord, you would use them and flow through them and that the Spirit of God would come on their gift. And we pray tonight that you bless our gifts of love and that it would multiply back to those who give it and it would bless to the work of the kingdom these men and women who go sent by you to share your message. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' strong name, And God's people said.
Squeak there. Hey guys, uh, my name is Evan, like I said before. Um, we're going to be transferring into some more serious stuff that we got going on, our more um, serious uh, skits and human videos for you. Uh, I'm going to intro this next skit. It's called Broken. Uh, how many of you know the Lord loves a broken and can try a heart? Uh, I remember when we started working on this skit and uh, the first times we started doing it, I was going through a really hard time in my life. Um, I was dealing with a lot of brokenness of my own, and it was just during this really rough time, my parents were getting a divorce, but I was away, my sister was back home dealing with it all, and I was stuck in college, and I was like, man, it feels really hard to like be able to study and, and focus on this when I've got so much going on at home, and everything just felt like it was falling out of place, and I felt like I had nothing going good for me. And it was in that moment, it was in those moments, because there was quite a few of them there, um, that God kind of just spoke to me, and He was just pouring into my heart more than ever and, and, and transforming who I was and it was in those three or four months of my life that I have gone through some of the biggest growth and transformation that I've ever gone through um, thus far so uh, with that I just want to like highlight that God is, is so good to us and, and it's so good for us to look back on those moments so he loves those broken and contrite people because they're humble, because they know that they've got nothing without God and that they recognize that. And so often we are going through good seasons of our life and we think we have it all together and we think we can do that without God because we just get caught up in our human pride. And I think it's, it's through these broken moments and, and the reminders of those broken moments that we see how God was so good to us and so faithful to us that we can reconnect with that moment, reconnect with God in a new way. We just hope you can see that in your own life in this next human video.
so just a little bit of my background. Um, about two and a half years ago, um, my dad um, got a job at a church in South Carolina. So I'm originally from Alabama, um, and we moved to Fort Mill. And so I was in the middle of my 11th grade year in high school, which is like the worst time ever to move. Um, it was super tough. I was trying really hard to make friends. Um, and I was looking at colleges, I was getting ready to school, Lee was my dream school, so I was like taking standardized tests, I was taking the ACT, I could not, I had a great grades, but couldn't get my score up, I was just struggling, um, I was feeling super bad about everything that was going on with school and with um, looking at my future and what was going to happen, and um, I was just feeling super ordinary and super um, in a terrible place, and I feel like the enemy was really sneaking lies telling me that I wasn't going to get to go to my dream school, that I wasn't going to get to amount to what the Lord had called me to, and I wasn't going to get to walk through any of that. Um, and I was getting super discouraged and super upset. And then I had to sit myself down and um, really just spend some time with the Lord. And I really felt like you were saying, Carissa, come on, you know better. You know what I've called you to, and you know that I'm going to bring you through it, and I'm going to um, take you to, to all that I promised you to. And so this next skit, um, it's mainly geared towards girls, but it's kind of just about when you're in those moments and you're feeling ordinary, and when you're trying all these different ways to feel extraordinary, it's only through him that you're going to feel that way. Um, and this is called Ordinary. Well, this is awkward. The truth. The truth is awkward. It's always awkward. And the truth is, I'm at my breaking point. I feel like I'm stuck in this vortex of expectations and constant failure. I don't know who I am or who I want to be. I feel like my identity is constantly under attack. Identity. A simple word with a thousand meanings. I am ordinary. I have ordinary looks. An ordinary personality. Very ordinary. My whole life I've been trying to stand out. Trying to be something exciting. Trying to be less ordinary. Trying a number of things. Acting out in school. Being a straight A student. A university cheerleader. Getting the biggest scholarship for college. Joining a bunch of clubs when I got to college. All over tons of makeup. And constantly fighting with my hair. Oh, and then there are the boys. Lots of boys. Finding a guy has been my number one priority. Finding a boyfriend. Set. A boyfriend's only job is to make you feel good. To make you feel extraordinary. And if he doesn't, you should find one that does. Well, boyfriends, they're hard to come by when you're ordinary. When I finally got one, he treated me like I was very ordinary. I got a second chance with him. And I knew I had to raise the stakes. I had to figure out something that would make me stand out. Figure out how I was finally going to get to keep him. But I went too far. I did more than I wanted. And then? He broke up with me anyways. And that's what brings me here today. Face to face with my brokenness. Face to face with the truth. And the truth is, I hate myself. I hate being ordinary. I hate feeling dirty. But with honesty comes revelation. I realize the reason I'm here today is because I put my value in the wrong man's hands. So I, I picked up my Bible. Yeah, yeah. It's a cliche scripture here. But that's exactly what happened. That's where the story ends. I read about a God who fearfully and wonderfully made me. A God who knew me and approved of me before I was even born. A God who sent his son to die for me. A God who called me beloved. And that's when I realized there's nothing ordinary about that. In the hands of this extraordinary God, I can find my identity. In the hands of this extraordinary God, I am known and I am loved. And in the hands of this extraordinary God, I am extraordinary. Hey, honey. Come on. 
Did you close the garage door? <laughs> yeah, I got it. Did you talk to the roofer about the estimate? It's going to be pretty tough to add that on top of the mortgage and the car payment, but... Seriously? What? Nothing. Well... What? Aren't you going to at least ask me how work was or something? Yeah. How was work? <laughs> Good. Good. When was the last time I met that word? When was the last time my wife asked me how I was doing and I actually told her? I told her that I miss her when I'm at work. That I miss her when I get home. I told her that it hurts me when she chooses her phone or her friends over me, over our family. Sometimes it's so bad. Sometimes I feel like I, I'm mourning my wife. I feel like I'm mourning the way things used to be, the way that they should be. I just want her to notice. You know, I, I just want her to realize that our family is falling apart. Good. That's good. I've been meaning to tell you, the girls and I are going to take our last week of vacation and go to Florida next week. Wait, really? Is that not okay? No, no, you know, it's fine. It's, it's okay. I'll just be late to work again because I'm dropping our daughter off at school. But you know what? It's okay. It's, it's whatever. It's, it's all good. Good. Hear that? We're doing good. I'm so thankful for my little family. I mean, this is as good as it gets. I have a husband who loves me, and my daughter, she's great, doing so good. Straight A student, captain of the basketball team, biochemistry tutor, worship leader, God seeker. I know, practically a textbook example of perfection. I don't know what I'm going to do when she graduates, but I guess I get a glimpse of that every Saturday night when she's at a friend's house and I'm left at home with him. You know how that is. Husbands are husbands. Nag, nag, nag. Fight, fight, fight. You start picking up the extra shifts at work so you don't have to be at home with him. You start hanging out with your friends a little more and going on dates a little less because you start wanting to be with them over your family. It's funny how that happens, but that's life. That's marriage. That's how families go. How they're supposed to be. You know what? No. Okay, it's not all good. I am sick of how you think you can do whatever you want while I'm stuck here picking up all the slack in this family. Are you family. kidding? I sacrificed so much for this family. Mom, Dad, I just want to remind you that this Tuesday's game decides if we go to regionals or not, so you guys should come. Sorry, honey. Your mother's not going to be able to make it because she's going to be living it up in Florida. Don't bring her into this. Wait, what? You're not going to be there? I'm so sorry. You know I'd be there if I could. I've had this trip in for weeks. Yeah, right. Anyway, how are you? I hate how people ask that. How they act like they care. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. You can go in circles like that for a few seconds. And they won't even realize that you've already answered their question like five times because they're not really listening. It's just something people say because it's something people say. Well, that and to make themselves feel good, like they're doing some noble act of charity for asking you. Asking their daughter how her day was. I wonder what would happen if I told them, if I actually told my parents the truth. Told them that I feel like I'm crumbling under the weight to be the best. Told them that I feel like I'm the only thing that's keeping their marriage together. Told them that sometimes I wish they'd just go ahead and get the divorce because I'm sick of this. Told them that I'm scared. That I'm scared of telling them. I wish that I could just tell them. So, you're good? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm good. How are you? As serious as this skit is, it is a little funny. You know, there were some chuckles out there because it is so relatable. Um, even if this isn't necessarily your family situation um, directly, it, we can all relate to that idea of hiding our pain. Um, the truth is, ever since Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, 
ever since they ate that fruit, their first instinct was they saw themselves naked and they wanted to cover themselves up. They wanted to hide. They didn't want each other to see what was really going on. They definitely did not want God to see what was really going on. I think we still do that today. We still have that, that fleshly instinct where we come into church, we shake everybody's hand, and when they ask us how we're doing, our, our response is always good. And we don't want to let them know what's really going on. And what, what, what does good even really mean? Right? Does this good mean, yeah, I was able to get two or three hours of sleep last night while mom and dad were yelling at each other, so yeah, I'm good. Does it mean my husband's away on a vacation or on a work trip, so you know I don't have to see him for a couple days, so I'm, I'm good. Does it mean I, I got home early, I got to actually have a conversation with my wife today, she would talk to me, so I'm, I'm good. Does it mean I haven't struggled with depression or suicidal ideation in the past couple of days, so yeah, I'm good. I'm pretty sure when God looked at his creation and called it good, this is not what he meant. The truth is, you've all been so blessed with the people around you. You've been so blessed with this church, a community, a pastor that loves you and wants to talk to you about what you're going through. It's human instinct, it's, it's human, it's fleshly nature to put that wall up. When people ask us how we're doing to say good, I would encourage you, please, if there's anything that you get out of this skit, don't hide your pain, because it only makes life that much more painful. Hey guys, like I said earlier, my name's Kevin. Um, this is going to be the last thing we're going to do for you guys tonight, and then Jordan's going to come up and close us with a kind of a final thought. Um, I think it's safe to say that all of us in here have a hobby, right? If you don't have a hobby, I encourage you to go find a hobby because hobbies are great. They're a great way to occupy your time. Um, my hobbies, I'll go ahead and share with you. I love sports. Um, I played sports in high school. I can talk your ear about sports, um, talk your ear off about sports. So if you want to talk about sports afterwards, meet me along and we'll do it. Um, I love music. I'm a musician, so I love listening to music. Um, I play video games. Um, I love watching dumb videos on YouTube. Yes, I am the typical college guy. Um, but uh, I don't know if we said it earlier, but we're full-time college students. We travel 10 months out of the 12, so we're really busy during the school year. Um, and it's hard to kind of fit everything that we want to do into a day. We only get 24 hours in a day, and you got to sleep some too. Um, so during the school year, it's kind of hard to find time to do the things that we enjoy. Um, and I had a quick come to Jesus meeting, literally, um, this past spring semester, and even while we were home in May, um, I found myself a lot of times not really cracking the word open and not really spending time with Jesus, and I'd remind myself, like, hey, Kevin, you really need to maybe do this, hey, let's spend some time tonight and do it, and then later that night, I found myself maybe watching a video or um, playing a video game, and um, even later on this past May, um, I was having a conversation with somebody, and we were just talking about basketball, and later that night, the Lord reminded me and said, remember that conversation, you know, um, you missed that opportunity to share who I am with that lost person because you were too busy worrying about discussing the basketball game. And, um, you know, the things that I enjoy, maybe the things that you enjoy, they're not inherently bad, but I think it's safe to say that sometimes we let them take the priority over God. Um, it's safe to say that we didn't do worship this evening, but you know, worship is something that maybe uh, we always think that is something that comes before the sermon on Sunday morning. Uh, but in reality, worship is everything that we do, everything that we give our time to, our attention to. We're in this constant state of worship. And when you give your time to these things and you start worshiping them, they become idols, which is kind of crazy to think because when we think idols, we think of these golden calves in the Old Testament, right? These things that the Israelites worship and God wasn't happy about. But in reality, these things are things that we're placing above God. So this next kid, you're going to see a guy who loves sports. You're going to see 
um, girls who are all about their appearance and worrying about how they look, um, a girl that's involved in social media, really loves social media, and then a relationship. And again, none of these things are inherently bad, um, but when they take the place of your relationship with God, when they're taking up way too much time, these things are becoming idols. Um, worship is more than just a song. So in this next game, we just want you to examine maybe the things that you are taking time in your life to do um, and see, hey, maybe this thing is taking up way too much more time and I need to maybe spend more time with God. This uh, last human video is called Quit the Stage. Clear the stage and set the sound in the lights of blaze. That's the measure you must take to cross the aisles. Chirp the pews and all the decorations too Until the congregation's few and high for rubble Tell your friends that this is where the party ends Until you fall care for your sins It can't be social and Seek the Lord and wait for what He has in store And know that great is your reward just be hopeful, cause you can sing all you want to, yes you can.
the measure you must take to cross the islands. Hey everyone. Um, like I said earlier, my name is Jordan, and I just want to share just a quick thought, maybe a quick story, if that's okay. Um, usually this is where our director, Michael, uh, Del Bonus, comes up and closes out the service. Um, so, you guys locked down because you got me tonight. <laughs> anyway, no, I'm, uh, um, we're extremely happy uh, and blessed that you guys would have us so that we can minister with you. I just want to say that. Um, a little bit of a background about me. Um, I am a digital media studies major, as I said before. Uh, with an in emphasis on cinema, so what does that mean, Jordan? That's a mouthful. It's a long term, basically, just to say that I like movies. Um, I get to watch movies and I get a degree for it. It's the best thing at Lee University. I love it. Um, it's extremely hard, as you can probably imagine. Um, but if there's one type of genre of film that I love, it is a thriller film. Not necessarily a horror, uh, not necessarily something very tame, but thrillers that keep you on the edge of your seat. They're just my favorite type of films. Um, and actually, the person who put those type of films on the map is Alfred Hitchcock. Is anybody familiar with Alfred Hitchcock? A little? Okay, so um, he wrote uh, Vertigo, Psycho, The Birds. If you've seen any of those classic kind of thriller films, he's the one behind that. He actually had a series of um, short um, kind of TV episodes, and it was called Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Um, and there was one that was called The Great Escape. Um, and so, basically how it opens is there's a woman who's in the courtroom, uh, she's wrongfully accused and wrongfully um, convicted of murder. So, they send her to a prison, um, and when she gets to the prison, she's not allowed parole, she can't get out early, she's there for life. Um, and so the way the episode unfolds is that every night, uh, they lock her up, she goes to bed, you know, in tears, she's just uh, being tormented for not for being there, for not doing anything. Um, and eventually, every night, the same security guard comes lost the doors on every, every door. And so eventually, she starts making friends with the security guard. They start talking, and um, it leads into kind of what you might call a relationship, kind of a romantic relationship between them, um, as much as you can have in prison. Like, they hold hands through the bars, and uh, I'll, I'll wait for you, like, I'll be there for you when we get out, both knowing that they would never get out of there. Um, but she would never get out of there, rather. And the way the episode goes is, one night, they're talking, they're holding hands, I love you, like, you're my everything, and all of a sudden, there's just this big gong, gong, and she freaks out, she says, what's that? He says, well, that's the death bell. She says, the death bell, what's that? He said, that is, so every woman in this prison is here for life. Um, no one's getting out, so that's when someone dies, they ring the death bell for you to uh, say a prayer for the family and remember if you knew her. And... So she said, okay, well, that's, you know, that's a little morbid, but you know, that's, that's the way it happened in that prison. So time went on, months uh, went by, and they, every night, just, I'll wait for you, I love you, you're my everything. And um, the security guard came up one night and said, okay, I've got it. I know how we're going to find we'll be together. She said, okay, tell me. So he said, the next time you hear the death bell, you hear the gong, I'm going to put a rope, a flashlight, and a key under your pillow. And when you hear that, sneak out, unlock your door, sneak down to the morgue, climb in the coffin with the dead body, tie yourself to the dead body. They'll pick you up, they'll take you out to the cemetery, the morticians will bury you, um, you'll have about two hours of oxygen, I'll come out, dig you up, um, and then we'll be free to live as we will. They'll never know what happened, she thought. Okay, that's a little weird, that's also a little morbid, but what else am I going to do? I'm here for life. So. She agreed. So months went by, weeks went by, every night they do the same. I love you, you're my everything, hands to the cell. Uh, and one night, it was about 3 a.m., she's sleeping, and all of a sudden she hears gong, gong. So she wakes up, she's like, okay, my heart's beating, and she's real nervous, almost as nervous as I am right now, seeing, sharing this with y'all. Um, she's real nervous. <laughs> um, she, she thinks, this is my moment, this is my moment, this is what we're going to do. So she removes her pillow, straight up there's a stuff she gets the keys, the rope, flashlight, she unlocks her cell, she goes down to the morgue, she climbs into the coffin, she ties herself to the dead body. Um, she feels the two morticians bring her out, they put her on a flatbed truck, she feels every bump in the road as they're going out to the cemetery, they lower her down, hearts was beating out of her chest, thinking this is the night I get to spend, uh, I, get, I get free. And they feel, they, she feels all the dirt being uh, buried on top of her, 
And she's laying there for a few moments and thinks, you know, I've known every woman in this prison. I've been here for years. I wonder who died. So she grabbed the flashlight. She turned it on only to reveal the face of the security guard. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, that's Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> now you know why I like these types of things. You're like, hold on. Look, these are the bags of sleep. When I heard that story first, when I watched that first, I was like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. <laughs> so I know what you're probably thinking right now. You're like, Jordan, why in the world did you come here to tell me some obscure, morbid story like that? Well, indulge me for a few moments and think about this. The very thing that that woman was tied to is the very thing that killed her. The only person that knew she was in that grave was the person who was with her. And in true Alfred Hitchcock fashion, the way the episode begins is the camera dollies back and then it just goes black. You hear her screams. No one's there. Obviously, the mortician's left. The screen goes black. That's the end. The very thing that she was tied to is the thing that killed her. In um, Clear the Stage, you saw these people. They were, they were doing things um, in a relationship, looking at social media. Um, they were tied to these things, right? But they, they're not nearly bad, as we said. But they, when they gave that much time to those things, it ended up killing them spiritually. Um, I was actually reading uh, the book of Jonah earlier today, and that seemed really appropriate for this because in Jonah, he gets uh, a call from God, he immediately runs, and he goes and pays for us to get on a ship and, and just go away. Well, he goes to sea, I think we all know what happens, the sea just starts going nuts, and the, the people on the ship say, well, is it, is it your God, is it your God that, can you pray to him and, and have us just be safe? And he says, no, I can't because I'm the reason that you guys are in this situation. So they ended up casting him over. So, um, just kind of in closing, I want you to think about it. Is there something that is a Jonah in your life? Something that you're tied to that's bringing you down spiritually? Is there someone who's a Jonah in your life that's bringing you down spiritually? And I, I hope not, but maybe this is the case. Are you a Jonah to someone tonight? So I'm just going to say a, a, quick, a quick prayer uh, and I'll pass it off to the pastor and close AC fit. Uh, so thank you again for having us so much. We've enjoyed being here. Father God, thank you so much um, for all that you've done for us. Lord Jesus, uh, we, we just want to say thank you for having this opportunity to come and worship you here tonight. Um, Father, I pray right now that as we uh, are getting ready to, to leave you tonight, that you bring it in our hearts, you help us recognize maybe some things that we're tied to that's taking us away from you spiritually, Father. If we are Jonas to someone, if someone's a Jonas to us, Father, if that you give us um, power and courage to be able to break those relationships or mend those relationships, Father, as you see fit, Father. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing at this church, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of your body, Father. We thank you so much for everything that you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.